Hello, everyone. My name is Ariel Matos, and I am the Associate Director for Graduate Admissions at Princeton University. I am very excited to be here with you all today to discuss the college admissions process. I know that all of you are currently at home uh, practicing social distancing and being safe, and I encourage and applaud your efforts to do so uh, to keep you and our community safe. And I know that many of you, if not all of you, are looking forward to returning to some sense of normalcy um, with the hopes of returning to Lawrence High School at some point within the fall semester or the coming months. Um, you know, at Prince University, we certainly hope the same thing for you all, um, to be able to return to some normal state uh, in which you all feel comfortable and confident enter entering into your academic institutions. Um, so without further ado, I would like to spend a few minutes talking to you all about the college admissions process. Um, I would also like to spend a few short minutes talking about financial aid and also applying into a very special program that is near and dear to my heart, which is the Educational Opportunity Fund Program. Um, so we're going to spend a few minutes together just talking about these different avenues for you to gain your college education, for you to finance that college education, and then also for ultimately for you to have a great experience. Um, so uh, without further ado, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share, I've created a PowerPoint for you all, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, so let's get started. So the title of today's presentation is Demystifying the College Admissions Process. Again, all of my contact information is currently on the screen. Uh, my name again is Ariel Matos and I'm the Associate Director of Graduate Admissions at Princeton University. So today we're gonna to talk about college admissions. We're going to talk about applying for financial aid. And then we're also gonna spend a few short minutes talking about the Education Opportunity Fund program. Um, so when you're thinking about the college admissions process, it, it is very important for you to, to think about which type of school it is that you're looking to enter into. Uh, there are four-year schools, there are two-year schools, there are public colleges, there are private universities, right? And everything offers something a little different. So for brevity's sake, uh, we're going to limit today's conversation to four-year schools and also two-year schools. So four-year schools are often much larger institutions that will have a larger student body. Uh, four-year schools will offer bachelor's degrees in various fields. Um, so coming from where I came from, I'm, I'm an alum from the College of New Jersey, and I also worked there as an assistant director of multicultural admissions for a few years. I really enjoyed my time being there. Uh, but at TCNJ, there are over 50 academic majors, right? Other schools like at Rutgers University will offer more than 75 different academic majors. So basically, the larger the school, the greater capacity they have for academic offering. So that is something that you certainly want to look for. Um, most four-year schools will offer an on-campus residential housing opportunity. Um, and if, if you are the type of student who wants to get away from home as quickly as possible, um, then that would be a, certainly be a viable option for you. Uh, living on campus is an amazing opportunity to uh, to really have that college experience, to get to know new people, to meet different people, but also more importantly, to learn a lot about yourself, to do, to do some of that maturing and that growing up process. Um, so I am a strong advocate for living on campus if you have the capacity to do so. Um, but again, this is certainly a benefit that many four-year schools will offer. But it's also important to, be, to note that four-year schools are often a bit more competitive. They have a more competitive admissions process, especially when compared to two-year schools. All right, so we're gonna talk about that competitive admissions process in a few slides, um, but for right now, just keep that in your back pocket, that four-year schools are going to be a bit more competitive when it comes to their admissions process. Now, we're gonna compare four-year schools to two-year schools. Two-year schools are traditionally your, your local community colleges. Uh, for all of you there at Lawrence High School, that will be Mercer County Community College. I also worked at Mercer County Community College before as well. Um, so I'm very familiar with their programming, uh, but community colleges, again, they offer um, associate's degrees or also technical certifications. Um, so, for example, if you wanted to go and get a, an associate's degree in funeral sciences, you could certainly get that at Mercer County Community College. Or if you wanted to go for a certification for a specific trade, if you wanted to go for HVAC training, you can also do that at Mercer County Community College. Um, either at Mercer or also at, at some local trade schools. Um, you know, both of these schools will have different iterations of different trades and occupations that you can go to school specifically to study for. Uh, but one of the biggest differences between a four-year school and a two-year school is that a two-year school 
has a much easier admissions process, meaning for four year school, you're going to, for most of them, you're going to be required to take an SAT. Now, the coming year, the, the graduating class of 2021 may have a different experience in terms of admissions requirements because of COVID. Some schools have become very lax on their SAT requirements. I know, for example, TCNJ um, is becoming SAT optional for the next few years as a result of COVID. Um, but historically, most four-year schools would have required an SAT score as part of their admission, their, their holistic admissions review process. Um, community colleges and two-year schools, generally, they do not. They don't require SATs. They don't require ACTs, right? The only, honestly, the only requirement to gain admission into a school like Mercer County Community College or a Cumberland County College or a Burlington County College is you must have the equivalent of a high school diploma. Uh, so that would, of course, mean a four, uh, graduating from high school, um, graduating from high school or also obtaining your um, like the, the, the GED, uh, that would also suffice for admission into a two-year school, all right? Um, and of course, cost is also going to be a very big factor because four-year schools, they offer a lot more in terms of academic support services, in terms of student services, they're, they're going to cost a bit more money. Whereas two-year schools, primarily students are commuting to the campus and they offer much less services. Um, you know, they don't have that residential component. So typically community college class, community college classes and also some trade schools are going to be a bit, uh, a bit cheaper than it would be if you were to go to a four year school. Now, in terms of college admissions, so for this portion, we're talking specifically about four year schools, because as I mentioned in the previous, in the previous slide, uh, most community colleges, the only admissions requirement is that you have a high school diploma or its equivalent. Um, so these parameters that we're going to discuss now spe are specifically for four-year schools. So in terms of those four-year schools, what are those colleges looking for? So most four-year schools will have what is considered a holistic application review process where they look at a few different aspects of your application before making a determination as to whether you would be a good fit for that institution or not. Um, Usually these five things are what these schools are going to be looking for, are going to be vetting in that holistic admissions review process. Uh, the first being a quality high school transcript. So colleges will want to make sure that you have the capacity basically to learn what they teach. They want to make sure that you're going to be able to, um, to, to stay afloat within the level of academic rigor that that institution is going to offer, right? So to, very, to put it very simply, the, Great colleges or, or some most colleges will look will want to see students who have a very strong and competitive academic transcript, meaning that colleges like to see students who have challenged themselves by taking uh, honors and AP classes. They want to see that rigorous coursework and they also want to see a strong proficiency in those academic areas. For example, if you are applying for an engineering degree, schools will want to make sure that you have a good background in pre calculus and also a strong math aptitude before admitting you into that program. So there are correlations there. If you want to become a doctor, if you want to go to medical school, again, your, your schools are going to be looking at how you performed in your math classes, the types of math classes that you've taken throughout high school, whether or not those classes were honors or AP. And then they're also going to check and see how it is that you performed on in your science classes, right? Because there is that, that core academic relevance there. So when, as you're selecting your classes, especially as you're going into senior year, Start thinking about the academic major, major that you would like to pursue and ensure that the courses that colleges are going to be looking for are there somewhere on your high school transcript because that will matter when an admissions counselor is reviewing your application. Now, good standardized test scores are also going to be important. Again, they probably more so in previous years when SATs were required. But again, as, as many colleges and universities are loosening their requirement for the SAT due to COVID-19, um, you know, you, and many of you will have the option whether or not to take the SAT. Now, personally, my recommendation is to still take the SAT if you can, either the SAT or the ACT, because there are many other benefits that are tied into that SAT or ACT score. For example, some schools may offer uh, scholarships continuing upon your SAT scores, right? So you may gain admission, but if you don't provide an SAT score, you may, you, you may make yourself ineligible for those scholarships. Right, so if you can, I would strongly encourage you to make sure that you're taking that standardized test, prepare for it, take it seriously, because there are, there are certainly direct benefits from receiving a good SAT score. Um, so again, schools will utilize SATs or ACTs as part of that holistic application review process, 
Most schools will, will require one or the other. So there is no preference whether you take the SAT or the ACT. It is honestly whatever you feel the most comfortable with. As part of the holistic application review process, students will, uh, schools will look at your extracurricular involvement. They want to see students who have been engaged in different clubs or organizations, students who have been involved in their civic communities, and students who have ultimately contributed um, to their local community, whether that be at the school or within their residential communities. Um, that simply trans, like if, if you're active in your high school and in your local community, that would translate for college as meaning that you would also be very active within a campus's community on campus. So they want to make sure that they can see that. They want to see that, that developing leadership that you can show through your involvement and engagement in extracurricular activities. They're going to read the letters of recommendation. Most schools will, will require at least two, one coming from a guidance counselor and one coming from a teacher. Um, but, most, but most schools uh, will, will give you the option to provide three or even four. Make sure that you are strategic about the letters of recommendation that, that you do submit. Again, I would try to tie them in some way to your desired academic major. If you're applying into an engineering program, you know, it would be helpful to have a math teacher write you a letter of recommendation, right? Because they can speak specifically to your core competency within that specific field. And lastly, your impassioned personal statement. As an admissions counselor, it has always been my favorite part of the application process because it gives the students an opportunity to fill in any blanks that may arise from their application, right? So when you think about your GPA and you think about your standardized test scores, those things are all numbers, right? They're, they're numbers that don't tell a full and holistic story. Your personal statement is an opportunity to fill in those blanks, right? So you want to make sure that you're writing about something that you're passionate about, something, you know, a motivation that you have uh, for pursuing that specific desired major or anything else that really gets you going. That is what your personal statement should, should focus on. There are no, there, there isn't a cookie cutter model for the perfect uh, personal statement. Again, you just want to make sure that if I'm a admissions counselor and I'm reading your personal statement, I want to be able to read your statement feeling confident that I have a great idea as to who it is that you are and what it is that motivates you. All right, so use that personal statement as an opportunity to fill in those blanks. So now that you've submitted your application, what goes into the admission decision? Um, so, you know, the way that you have to think about it is that think of it as a courtship, right? So think of it as you are like you're, 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 you're courting someone or you're very interested, right? in pursuing someone in a relationship, right? So as you're pursuing that person, you want to make sure that that person is going to be a good fit for you, that they're going to compliment you. And, and your interests and the things that you are looking to do um, as an individual, you want to make sure that they're going to be on your level, right? You want to be, you want to make sure that they're going to be able to understand your jokes and the nuances that you that you may possess, right? And you also want to want to be able to, you also want to gauge and see if they're going to help you grow as an individual, right? Because a courtship or relationship is a two-way street, right? There should be a benefit for both parties involved within this relationship. Well, take that thinking and then apply that to the admissions decision process, right? So colleges, what they're going to do is as you're looking over your entire application, they're going to try, they're going to try and gauge if you will be a good fit for that institution, if you're going to be able to manage the level of academic rigor that you're going to find there, if you're going to be able to fit within the student body and the student population there, and also if you are going to be able to grow there on that college campus. They want to make sure that you are going to be able to give back and invest yourself and develop those necessary leadership skills within that campus community, right? Because again, it's an investment in the college and you and your development as a student, but it's also an investment for you because attending that college or university will help to provide you with the credentials that you will need to move forward within your career. Again, it is a two-way street. It's a courtship. It's a relationship. Look at it as such when you are applying to these respective colleges and universities. So it's critical when you're thinking about these colleges to, to have an understanding as to what it is that you are looking for, right? So think of yourself as a consumer, right? For the next four years when you attend college, you are going to be spending either your money, the government's money, or someone else's money in order to attain this college degree, right? So you have to have a good understanding and an investment in that choice that you're going to make. So when you're looking at these different colleges and universities, you know, I would challenge you to really think about a few different things. So first, what are your academic interests? What are, you, what are you academically interested in? What are your favorite subjects in school? If you could only take one class for the rest of your life, what would that class be? Think about what it is that excites you as an academian, as a student, 
And then I would encourage you to try to pursue a major that ties into that realm, right? Because if you really enjoy studying that particular academic field, right, then that will, that will give you the, 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 the excitement, right, and the, the investment to actually study and, and to do the work that is required for you to do to earn that degree, right? So when you're, when you're thinking about schools, also you have to consider what are your social interests? Are you the type of student who would prefer to just sit in your room and study all day and get and, 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 and fully immerse yourself with an academic course material? Are you the type of student who would like to party every night? Are you the type of student who would like to party every now and again, but not too often, right? Every school will offer a different social scene, right? Or a different social atmosphere and environment, right? Consider that when you are thinking about the schools that you will attend. If you're looking for a party school, for example, you won't, like TCNJ is not a party school, right? Um, so that's something for you to consider. However, if you, are looking for is like if, if, you, if you want to be the type of person who is always going to be in your room or in a library and you're looking for students who are research oriented right it would be helpful to consider a research oriented school right so make sure that you're look you're thinking about that when you're looking at these respective schools as well what are your professional interests um it would be helpful to, to consider some of the alumni who have graduated from those respective institutions that you're applying into because that can start to build your professional network Right, so it's it's always a good asset that schools possess. Um, so as a, as a prospective student who's going to be applying to these colleges, look at their alumni alumni list. Check and see uh, who are the graduates from that school and where they currently are working, because that that list could create a pathway for you um, moving forward as you, as you begin to think about your own career. Another thing that you have to look for and think about is what is it, your family's current financial situation. I mean, we we don't like to talk about um, paying for our college education because it can be very expensive, it can be very pricey, right? But every college has a different cost, all right? So that's that's one thing to think. Every college has its own cost. Um, as well, students who are applying for college can also have access to different types of financial funding to pay for, for college. Some colleges will offer scholarships if you have a certain GPA or a certain class rank. Um, the federal government through the FAFSA offers some need-based uh, financial aid awards, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And there are certainly other opportunities to acquire funding to pay for your college education, right? And then you also have to think about what it is that you, your own personal family can contribute to your own education. Some families will have, um, or some students will have a college fund already prepared for them. Um, some students, unfortunately, their parents may not, may have very limited resources to help support them to pay for college. Uh, whatever your situation is, have a good understanding of that is uh, of what that is before you start applying to these colleges. And then lastly, why do you want to attend college, right? So for many of us, the idea is, you know, we, we just believe forever that we will attend college, right? But you have to have that own, you have to have your own personal sense of motivation and inspiration for wanting to, to attend college. So why do you want to go to college, right? Answering all of these questions will help to serve, your, will help to serve as a guide as you begin considering the different education opportunities and institutions available for you to apply to, right? So um, once you gain admission into a college, so be mindful that a college education is much more than just what happens in the classroom. I've alluded to some of this when talking about social opportunities on campus in the previous slide, but just to delve into this a little bit deeper. Um, so just a few things that really stick out to me as a, as a college admissions officer um, that I'd like to point out to you um, regarding a college education. So first and foremost, academics. Um, in a college classroom, there, there will be a difference, that, a difference in your learning um, that will take place uh, between memorizing and developing critical thinking skills. Uh, so for some of you, high school um, has been much more about you reading course material, memorizing that course material, and regurgitating it on a page when it's time for you to take an exam. College is not like that. Um, so a college, a college will challenge you to take what you're learning in that class and to start developing your own critical thinking skills or to start thinking, engaging with that material in a realistic way, right? So it's learning A and B, but then also learning about how you can utilize A and B in order to answer C, right? So that's a different level of thinking that you will encounter once you get into a college classroom. And then you also have to assume responsibility for your own education. In high school, for the most part, your counselors will create your schedule based on a predefined path. In college, you create 
your own academic schedule. For example, if you don't want to take classes on Tuesdays or Fridays because Tuesday and Friday are party nights, you have the flexibility to create your own schedule, right? So you are responsible for that. So in that way, you're going to start developing um, your own level of maturity and also personal growth um, when you're your college student. So the college education will also include um, and be, be very heavily impacted by your social experience. Uh, you deciding to join different campus organizations or social networks, the friendships and the relationships that you will develop in college uh, for most people will become lasting and lifelong relationships. Um, some of the friends that I made in college, I'm still very close with, a lot of them actually, are, I'm very close with today. Um, and a lot of them have been able, have been very instrumental in terms of helping me grow as a professional as well, right? So that social network that you'll develop, that social experience is, is something that you will acquire while you're, you're living, living and studying at a, at, a, at a college, right? So that's something else that you will be paying for, um, that you'll be paying for, you know, throughout your four years at, at, a, at a college or university. And then the other thing, the other key thing that you're, that's going to happen when, as, a, as a college student is your personal development. Right, so again, you're going to encounter, you're gonna to have to make different decisions, you're going to have to mature, uh, you're gonna to have to assume responsibility for yourself and your own academic growth. Um, so all of that will be taking, all of these things, these three things, your academics, the, the socializing, the social life, your social experience, and also your personal development will all be taking place at the same time while you're a college student. And all of these things will ultimately influence your college experience. Right, so college is going to be a really great opportunity for all of you. Um, I would encourage you to have as much fun as you can while you're researching your different colleges. I would encourage you as much as possible um, to interact with the admissions offices at those schools. If you are able, if COVID allows us to visit college campuses, get out there, get your, get your feet on the ground at those respective institutions because walking on a college campus is very different from hearing about it. Right, you wanna make sure that you're going to be able to feel comfortable, that you're going to be able to feel at home while you're there at that respective institution. So if you can, schedule an in-person campus visit. If you can't visit due to COVID, um, I know many colleges and universities are offer offering virtual opportunities and virtual tours of their campuses right now. Try to take advantage of any, any, any and every opportunity that might be available to you. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the Education Opportunity Fund Program. So just a very quick little background about myself. I am a first generation uh, college student. Uh, I come from a lower income family, right? So when it was time for me to fly to college, I didn't have many resources that were there to support for me. Um, fortunately for me, I was granted admission into this Education Opportunity Fund program at the College of New Jersey. And EOF honestly really changed my life. Um, it, it prepared me for college. It gave me the, the necessary academic and the social tools to be a success there in college, right? So the EOF program is a New Jersey funded program. Um, the way that it works is you, you, you must first be eligible for the EOF program in order to apply and, and qualify. So eligibility is based on a few things, which include citizenship status. So EOF is eligible for US citizens and eligible non-citizens um, only at this current time. Um, you have to be able to qualify based on family income, right? So there are income parameters for those who may qualify for EOS. And typically EOS students will fall within the first generation college status or college parameters, all right? Um, so if you feel like you, you fit into these categories, you may, EOS may be a great opportunity for you. Be mindful that different institutions have different goals and capacity for EOS. Uh, some, some schools will provide an EOF program, but will provide, you know, a $1,500 or a $1,500 grant that they provide you with every semester to pay for your academic, your academic needs, right? Other schools will pay for your entire, like for an entire two years worth of your academic studies um, at that respective institution. TCNJ is one of those schools. If you are admitted into the EOF program at TCNJ, they will fully cover your entire first two years, right? So, you can, so EOF will vary from school to school. As a student, it's important for you to do the research to, to determine which one would be the best fit for you. Um, also be mindful that, that schools that offer more financial resources, maybe more competitive to, to, to gain admission. Again, all things to take into consideration. But the EOF program will provide you with continued academic, social, and financial support, and they'll certainly offer a sense of community development for you. 
right? So again, a lot of those friends that I made in college, I actually met them in EOF. Um, so EOF will have a mandatory uh, five or six week summer program that you will have to participate in prior to starting in school in the fall. Um, but again, that community of people that you will meet, honestly, many of those people will become your lifelong friends. So to continue the conversation about EOF, I'm gonna take a, just a few seconds and um, I'm gonna ask that you look over this EOF income eligibility scale. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to look and see how many people live in your, you're gonna, you're gonna figure out how many people live in your house and then you're gonna go to the right of that and you're going to, you're, you're going to see something that says gross income not to exceed. Basically, if you have four people living in your household, your family's income cannot exceed $51,500 per year, right? That's a very simple and rough way to look at EOF eligibility, all right? So uh, please take a picture of this slide, and if you have any further questions about EOF, you can certainly reach out to your guidance counselors, or you can also Google NJ EOF program requirements, and these programs will pop up right for you. So in terms of financial aid, um, there are two different ways in which you can do that. Uh, the first being gift aid and the second being self-help aid. So gift aid is done, is, is, it's provided in different forms of grants, whether federal or state grants. All federal grants are conducted through the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, and all state grants here in the state of New Jersey are provided through NJHESA or the Higher Education Student Assistance Authority. Um, so you can also receive gift aid uh, through scholarships through which you can apply through your guidance department. And there's also an app that you can download for your phone called Scholarly, which has a lot of different scholarship opportunities available. And some schools you can also apply for fellowships. Now in terms of self-help aid, um, self-help aid is typically uh, student aid that you do have to, that you have to pay back. And these are primarily in the form of student loans. Uh, whether they be federal or private, or also payment plans that you can organize directly with your respective institutions. In terms of student loans, many of those you can apply, to, you, you can qualify for them when you, when, you, when you complete the FAFSA. In terms of private loans, uh, you, can also become you can become eligible for these through contacting your, respect, you, your institution of higher education, whatever school you decide to attend. You can ask them for leads about different private loans. You can search for these on, our, on the internet. You can ask the local bank or a credit agency, right? But just be mindful that private loans tend to be a bit stickier in terms of their repayment options and also their interest rates. So if at all possible, um, I encourage students to try to stay away from private loans um, because they may have variable interest rates, which may mean nothing to you right now. But basically, private loans can be a lot more expensive in the long run, right? So um, but again, they are certainly available to students who might need additional funding to pay for their college education. And then also these payment plans are, you know, just, just very simple math. The way that it'll work is if you owe your college uh, $5,000 in tuition, you would have five months to pay it off. So for the next five months, you would have to pay $1,000 every month in order to, to satisfy the cost of attendance at that institution, right? And again, with these payment plans, you would, you would create these directly with, with your respective academic institution. Now, in applying for financial aid, uh, the first stop would be the free application for federal student aid or the FAFSA. On the screen, I have uh, listed the, the specific website that you need to use for the FAFSA. Uh, the reason why I did that is because some students will inadvertently go to FAFSA.com and unfortunately that is a very fraudulent site which would charge you money to complete your FAFSA and it's also, again, it's a fraudulent website. So you run the risk of them stealing some of your very personal information such as your date of birth and your social security number. So when, when you look to begin the FAFSA, please make sure that you're going to the correct website which is FAFSA.ed.gov. Again, the application is completely free. As you're preparing to collect the documents necessary to, to, to fill out the FAFSA, the FAFSA will ask for your family's income uh, from the tax year 2019. Uh, so any W-2s, actually, if you just have your parents' tax return from 2019, that will, be, that will suffice. That, that's all that would be required to fill out your FAFSA. If you as a student completed your own taxes, it would be also, it would be also helpful to have your own tax return to also um, use when filling out the FAFSA. So when also when filling out the FAFSA, be mindful that every student and also 
one, at least one parent will be responsible for creating an FSA ID. And the website for the FSA ID is fsaid.ed.gov. Um, an FSA ID will basically serve as a secure PIN number. Um, it's, an, it's, it's a way to create a secure electronic signature that is going to be required in order for you to fill out that application. All right, so again, every student and every parent will require their own. Um, you have to register and create your own FSA ID. Uh, so it's going to be important for you to visit this website that I'm sharing to go ahead and create that FSA ID. Now that the FSA ID can be created at any time. You can actually log in after this session and create your own FSA ID and help create one for your parents. But again, before you are able to complete your FAFSA, it is going to, you're gonna be required to, to provide an FSA ID. All right, so please take the necessary moments to go ahead and create that. Um, so, and, so basically that's, that's all the information that I have for you all. Um, college admissions, it is a very anxiety and it's, it's an anxious time. Um, it could be stressful. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty around it because you don't know whether or not you're going to get in. You may hear that your friends may get into your dream school and you may not, or you may get in, but your friends won't, right? Just remember that your college experience is your own college experience. Make the most out of it. You know, have as much fun as you can uh, during this college experience. You know, I would encourage you to, you know, Think about, you know, to have a REACH school, to have a safety school, right, to have those, those different categorizations of schools that you're currently considering, right, and, and apply. Um, you know, one of the things that I wish I would have done when I was a student was I wish that I myself would have applied to Princeton University. Uh, graduating from high school, I was a very great student, but honestly, being a low-income first-generation student, I didn't think that I would, I, I didn't think I would have been accepted. I didn't think that I was good enough to get in. Right, and now that I am an associate director of admissions at Princeton, you know, I can look back at that time and I can recognize um, that self-doubt that I had. So as an admissions counselor, I would highly encourage you, like if, if you really want to attend a school, you know, do the research, check and make sure that it will be a good fit for you, go on a college tour, speak with an admissions counselor, and get some honest advice before you submit that application, right? Because again, you, you never know what the opportunities are going to be. Um, so I, I certainly wish you all of the best as you all are moving forward. On that last slide, before I, I stop sharing my screen, I did have my email address. It's very simple. It is ariel.matos at princeton.edu. If any of you have any questions or need any help, anything that I can help you with, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and let me know. But honestly, your, your best resources right now are going to be your counseling staff there at Lawrence High School. Ms. Doreen Welsh, I absolutely love her. Um, she is an amazing resource for all of you at the high school. You know, if you can schedule a meeting with her or schedule a meeting with your own guidance counselor, but they are going to be your best resources for beginning this college admissions process. So again, anything I can do to help you all, please reach out to me, let me know. I wish you all the best. Uh, stay, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you all soon in the very near future. Congratulations to you all.